It's hard to believe that just a few months ago, streets like this went up in flames. Homes and businesses were burned to the ground. Britain went into lockdown. It seemed like some people felt that looting was just a way of getting their hands on the material possessions that they were entitled to. The finger was pointed at teenage gangs, and more than half the people charged with offences were under 21. I'm Reggie Yates, and tonight I'm trying to find out what makes gang life the chosen path for thousands of teenagers and Britons in the cities. But I'm starting off with some pretty firm views. I've long believed that everybody has choices in life and that no one is forced to become a criminal just because they grow up poor. I grew up on a council estate in a house that for a long period of time was essentially living off of benefits. And I believe that your surroundings don't define who you are. I think it's you as an individual, how much work you're willing to put in, that determines how well you do. But I'm going to test my beliefs on a journey that will take me to some pretty dangerous places. Over the last three months, I've spent time with four young people who've all been right at the heart of gang life in Britain. It's not been easy for them, but they've allowed me an insight into their world. Aaron was a member of one of the most feared teen gangs in South London and served time in prison. I've done a few things, you know, like robberies, but paid the price for it. Talise has been involved in selling drugs for another London gang and was the victim of a vicious assault. How many times were you stabbed? I was stabbed about 14. 14 times. Shaquille lost a friend to a vicious gangland war. People do get killed out here. I, I can't even lie about it, innit? And Darren was a member of one of the most ruthless gangs in Manchester. Basically, you wouldn't look at us a lot wrong, cos if you did, you'd be next one in the back of the ambulance. So where does the responsibility lie? Am I right that it's down to the individual and the choices that person makes? Or is it about their environment, things that are often outside of their control? I'm going to try and find out. For four years, Aaron Roden was a member of one of the toughest gangs in Stockwell, South London. Now he's trying to put his energy to more constructive use. Five days a week, he packs his sports kit and heads down to the local gym. But he misses the status and fast money that came with gang life. You can never get used to having no money, you know? But it's just something that has to be done sometimes. Obviously, it's depressing, but I just got to accept it. Isn't it? Aaron served nine months of a two-and-a-half-year sentence for ABH. And since April, he's been out on licence, but he's finding it tough. I might not have the strong enough willpower to stay off the streets, you know, and then influences come in from elsewhere, and they will just come and overpower your willpower, you know. So you've got to have the mind and the strength to want to do it for yourself. So what was life like for Aaron inside a gang? And has he really been able to put the fast money and prestige behind him? Aaron, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm good, thank you. Well, thanks for having us. Upstairs, straight to the room. I said this is the penthouse. Yeah, this is where it all goes down. <laughs> got loads of them. You've got all your hats on your wall. Are they it's like your prized possessions, would you say? Yeah, it is. My hats are memories. Okay. If you look at this one here. 031, what's that? I was just like a current gang at the time. What did you guys do? You know, get into beef, altercations, drugs, whatever it is. But you say drugs like it's a small thing, but for most people it really mm. isn't. Were you dealing, were you selling? It's like selling, isn't it? you got to go and get money however you can get it. That's the mentality of the young people. There must have been a moment when you decided to go down the wrong path that led to actually being involved in an organised gang. What happened? What was that moment when everything changed? I was about 14 years old and someone had just basically come up to me and he said to me, oh, I just stabbed someone quick, you know. Um, I got the blood on my knife and everything, kind of brought out the knife. You had the knife in front of you? Had the knife in front of me. 
you know, he asked me just to follow him to the bus stop. And then it got to the point where, you know, I ended up following him around for the whole day. He kind of like, in a way, he kidnapped me. And like, he took my phone, he took my chain, took my big diamond ring. After that day there, my trust for people in general, it just went down, you know. I mean, I didn't want to be so exposed like that again. So after all of that, you started carrying the knife yourself, right? Then, would you have used it? I would have had to. I would have had to. There's no point in carrying it. And you can, you could go to jail for just having a knife, so I might as well use it if I'm going to have it on me. Aaron's been upfront about his time with the Otre One Bloods gang. But I wanted to know why he'd been sent to prison. You know, it was a robbery, you know, kind of thing, drug dealers and stuff. Why don't you want to talk about what actually happened? Because really and truly the people or the victims of it could be watching right now and they might feel, not feel that they, you know, justice was served. They might feel, raw. Oh, I so-and-so, you know, so-and-so there, well, oh, he's on the TV there. I don't I remember him from the court case there. You know, kind of thing. Oh, let's, you know, let's go after him still. They, they might be like that, you know, people are, don't know how people are. Aaron still has to look over his shoulder whenever he goes out. He took me to the estate in South London where he grew up, and he seemed uneasy about being on the streets with the cameras. There's beef, there's real shootouts. People have shootouts all the time, you know, it's a stock or this is real. I mean, people. When was the last time you saw, saw a shootout around here? 08, 2008 was the last vivid one I could remember. Little party in the pub, mm -hmm. and someone came and shot it up, you know. Two bouncers outside the pub, both of them got hit up. One shot, shot in his head. Everyone in the club had to walk over his dead body to get out of the club, kind of thing, you know. That was the last real one I could How old was you at this point? I was 18, 17 or 18. So at 17, you're think. stepping over a, a dead body to get out of a club, out yeah. of a pub. I mean, did that not no, no, affect no. you in any way? The shootings and stuff, it got so regular that things used to happen and I will go back to the block and laugh about it. Literally, like, if you come away and no one got hurt, you're laughing. There's no doubt Aaron wants to turn his life around. But how long will his resolve last? Because he spent so much time before he went in being used to the trappings of his former lifestyle, I'm not entirely sure whether he's going to be OK and be able to stick it out. You know, I think that the temptation is massive, and I really hope that he doesn't fall to it. One thing I want to get across in this film is that gangs are not just a black issue. In most of Britain's big cities, there are all sorts of gangs, Asian, white and black. So I'm heading to the Northwest, once again to find out whether people there choose to join gangs or are they forced into it. Here in St Helens, these young people were part of a rehabilitation scheme. They've all committed serious offences, most involving gang violence. Darren Burns was a member of one of the toughest gangs in Manchester. Now he gets a kick out of helping out at this old gym. How much are you enjoying this then? Um, it, it is actually quite fun. You throw a few laughs in there with it, you know. OK. Yeah. What you make of it yourself, innit? That's it again. Boxing lessons are the most popular part of the course. After watching these young people land some pretty fearsome blows, I took the chance to find out what drove them into gangs. Basically, you wouldn't look at us a lot wrong, because if you did, you'd be next one in the back of the ambulance. That's how it was. And um, what were you known for? Drug dealing, weapons, fighting, everything. <laughs> Darren lived in 42 different care homes from the age of five. At 14, he joined up with Manchester's notorious Gooch gang. Other gang members served time for murder as they fought rivals for control of the drugs trade. You don't look like the sort of person that would have a gun in his pocket. Um, what was it that attracted you to it? And, and did you not think that this, this might not be for me? Ah, well, at the time, I was, I'd gone through a stage of being bullied at school, so at the time, that was my way out. That was my way of saying, listen, I'm not a muppet. I'm not going to let you trample all over me. So I wanted the reputation that came with it. The reputation where I was like, if you did something, it wouldn't just be me coming to get you, it'd be someone else as well. So you were being bullied as a teenager. Yeah. What was the one moment where you said, I've proved my point now, they won't mess with me again? I went up to the biggest guy in the school and just trampled him all the way down the stairs, because he was the main one. And I was only in year nine then, he was in year 11. 
So he's one of the oldest kids in the school yeah, and you, yeah. you beat him up? Yeah, I threw him down the stairs. After that point, did things change for you? Did people look at you differently? Yeah. Did you enjoy that? I loved it at the time, yeah. I was thinking, right, I'm untouchable. You get, like, this sort of in invincibility cloak over you. It's like, no-one can touch you. Now that you're out of the gang, do you see it differently? Yeah. Boys will be boys, do you know what I mean? But it's a completely different perspective now. I wanna do you think it's a bit change. stronger than boys will be boys? I, I know what you're saying, but, like, when you're there, it's like a family. You protect each other. So Darren believes he had to be in a gang as a way of finding security, almost a surrogate family. His environment gave him no alternative. But is he just an exception to my belief that it's all about individual choices? I'm heading back to London for a meeting with someone else who's agreed to tell me her story about life inside a teenage gang. Talise Sakai was in a gang from her early teens. She was often involved in fights and earned money as a lookout for drug dealers. She's moved out of her parents' house and now lives on this estate in Morden, Surrey. For Talisa, it's a key part of breaking away from the gang. Her flat represents independence, but it also shows the choices she now has to make. Hello. Hey. Oh, well, guys, How you doing? doing man? I'm all right, man. You all right? She has to find £120 a month towards her rent. And that's the sort of money she doesn't have. This is your place, yeah? This is my room, boy. Okay. Not, the, not the messiest, but it's not the neatest either. All right, don't worry. <laughs> I ain't getting a hoover out. Uh, yeah, this is the living room still, right here. Talisa insists she's now out of the gang. And the turning point came five years ago. One day, I got a phone call from my friend, and then I came up my house to meet them. But they wasn't there, so I was thinking, what's going on? So I saw this dude that I thought I was cool with. So I went up to him, and then all I remember, I just saw a knife, and he just went for me. I didn't really feel anything. It's just that all my emotions just went. I was just thinking, how am I going to survive this? How am I going to get out? How am I going to see my mum again? And how many times were you stabbed? 14 times. Do you have scars? I don't really want to show. It's not enough. You don't have to show me, but do, do you have yeah. some? <laughs> so what do you think when you see the scars from, from the stabbing? When it's a bad day, I'm thinking, why didn't I, go, why didn't I just die like, with the scars? And then when it's a good day, I think I overcome this, and this is what makes me today, and this is why I'm living today. Since leaving the gang, as your... That's all right, don't worry about it. All right, it's all right, it's okay, it's okay. Are you sure? Yeah, if you need to... Talisa's phone rings throughout our interview, and something's going on. Switch off. Popular girl. Who's texting you? He, is this on camera? Mm. He's actually one of my friends still, but I just leave it a little. Why are they texting you so much? I don't know. No? no. OK. I've only known Talisa a few hours, but I can tell she knows more than she's letting on. What's going on? Nothing. It's just one of my friends, like, they just, like, they're still on their, on their grind, isn't it? They're still doing what they want to do, isn't it? But I understand what you mean, but for the people that don't, can you okay. explain what you mean by on their grind? They're, they're still hustling, basically, to live, like, a nice life, to live, like, a decent life. Everyone deserves... What, they hustling how? Like, just showing stuff. Selling drugs? Yeah. And why are they calling you? Because they want me to get one of my friends to get get it off them, but I don't want to do it. I don't want to do that. She, she says she doesn't want to be involved, but explains some people believe they're entitled to a better lifestyle, even if it is funded by selling drugs. Talisa switches her phone off, but when she turns it back on, it starts up again. I actually, f oh my god! You just turned it back on again. Yeah. Okay. I don't want to answer, and then you try to come here. I'm mean, answer your phone. You sure? Now, there's a knock on the door. Who's that? The boy. Stay here. Shall I answer it? Yeah. Come back later, please. I'm even bringing you BBC out here. BBC. Come back later, please. I'm on the mic. Look. Yeah? When the it felt obvious that Talisa's friend would be coming back once we'd gone. 
But that wasn't quite what she told us. What happened? I just told him to go. What did he come here for? Just to talk to him, but I told him to go. Is there a temptation there to get involved? Not even a little one. Why are you so sure? Why am I so sure? Because I know where it can lead me to again. And what can it lead you to? Probably prison or death this time, death or truth this time. You see, I like Talisa, but despite her good intentions, I'm worried that she might be letting her environment get on top of her. I want to say that she's being a better person and moving on, but the fact that her phone continuously rings and randomly you've got a guy turning up out of the blue, knocking on her front door, trying to get her to sell drugs for him, says to me in, in her mind she wants to move on and thinks that she is, but I'm not sure if that's actually what's really going on. The next day, I met up with Aaron. He'd agreed to take me to another estate close by that was territory of the All About Money gang. They'd had a serious beef with the Otre One Bloods that Aaron belonged to. It's part of a turf war that has cost up to 10 lives in the last decade. Aaron seemed nervous here, and sort of on the alert. A couple years ago, you know, he's come and meet around there for football, just chill around there in the little park. Yeah. You know, at one stage. Do you know what, I've, um, I've heard about a place called The Hotspot. Is that anywhere near here? Oh, that's right there, yeah. Just literally just there? Yeah, right across What's the road. What's that then? Um, that's a called Stockwell Gardens Estate, yeah. also known as Hotspot. Why is it called that then? Um, I think because police always used to be around there, you know. Yeah. Like, yeah, it's just, a, it's just like a bait strip, you know. It's hard to believe that this little parade of shops with a small courtyard could be such a prized piece of gang territory. But this can be a dangerous place. So if we were to go there now with the cameras, myself yeah. and you, would that be a problem for you? Um, yeah, I'm not really trying to condone any of that. Why is that? It's not my job to really do that, you know. I'm not a reporter. Mm. However, you know, it's, it's yeah, it's just... Not me, it's not, it's not me. You look really uncomfortable. You look really uncomfortable yeah, about going yeah. over there. What is it about? No, it's about not even this area about. In it's not even that, but it's like because of my affiliates, you know, they had uh, problems with these lot. So, in a situation like this, with someone who was once in a gang going to an area that they shouldn't be mm. seen around, even though they're out, mm. is it still dangerous? It shouldn't be. It shouldn't be, but it can be. I finally realised why Aaron's so nervous here. This area is at the heart of a postcode war between rival gangs. To try and turn their lives around, Aaron and Talisa have signed up for a course of intensive personal coaching. I've come to see what they do and how they get on. It's not in the sort of place I'd expected, right in the heart of London's affluent West End, Covent Garden. It's called Rap Mentors, a private company which offers coaching to young people at risk of getting involved in gangs and to others who want to become mentors themselves. Is it OK to take your mentee home with you? No! The project manager is 41-year-old David Williams. He spent time in prison 20 years ago, but now wants to help other young people avoid a life of crime. Is it OK to share a spliff with your mentee? He knows that it will be a hard road for Aaron and Talisa. There will always be struggles because, you know, they're living in the same environment, they're in the same community, they know the same friends, and the peer pressure is very, very great. David believes that outside forces can be strong. Did anyone do any of that homework? At the group discussion, Aaron explains why he resisted the temptation to take part in the London riots. Even though I felt like I was missing out on the opportunity, I wanted to be a part of history. His decision not to join in the looting suggests he's already moving forward. Just keep myself still. And obviously, I'm on licence as well, so I don't want to go out there and get reminded straight away and have to do my licence, plus extra charges. That's... But Talisa still has problems. Sometimes it's not the person, you know, that messes up. It's the friends around you because they're jealous of you if you're doing better than them or whatever. So sometimes it's people as well. And people. Only a few days ago, she was involved in a row on the street with another girl in which a mobile phone and money went missing. You've got used to bad She's still angry, and it quickly becomes clear that things haven't been resolved. 
Come in, come in, come in, come in, come in. We're going to put you in the groups. Come in. Julie, the girl from the phone row, walks into the class, face to face with Talisa. Try as she might, it seems Talisa can't escape trouble. Everyone else tries to act as peacekeeper. So we need to find out if Talisa's all right and what's been going on, but um, it seems like what's going on outside of trying to bear herself is come back and bear um, in the lesson. How mad is that? I talked to both Talisa and Julie to try and get to the bottom of what happened. Basically, me and my brother just like late in Midland Station, yeah. Then all of a sudden, something came up to us, sprayed me in my eye, like with a juju spray, yeah. I wasn't there, I like Angel. I wasn't there when all this, she gave this uh, sister the money. They were telling me what happened. It's a complicated story to say the least of it. And even when I've heard both sides, I'm not much the wiser. I don't want to be seen like a snitch, but come on, she can't do this to me. This may seem petty and juvenile, but it's clear that passions are running high. And if they'd run into each other on the street, it could have blown up into something much more serious. Eventually, they make up. For now. Thank you very much, all right? The afternoon has been an eye-opener. I've learned that however much you want to change, things from the world outside can come and trip you up. <laughs> I've also learned how different Aaron and Talisa are. They're both trying to turn over a new leaf, and Aaron, it seems, is out well on his way, whereas Talisa was um, distracted right in front of us. And um, the old Talisa was brought back out to play. So um, how well they do and how much they progress, well, um, hopefully we'll find out. And hopefully it'll be positive. We shall see, I guess. So far, it's been an education. The more I see, the more I understand that the reasons people are drawn into gang life are complex and often very different. I'm heading back to the hotspot, the home of the All Bout Money gang where I'd been with Aaron. And tonight, David Williams for the Covent Garden Project is taking me there. I'm gonna take this right here. He's trying to find gang members willing to talk to me. The hotspot is dangerous, even when it isn't dark. The police always keep an eye on it, and tonight it looks like things may have kicked off already. They're going some on their way down there now. And I'm not even joking. I'm serious <laughs> about they're going straight down there. And that's not a joke. I'm telling you. They're most likely gang men in yeah. that area, you know? Um, okay. And what are those issues then? Street robberies, gang culture. Okay. You know? Um, Straight up. Bit of hostility, yeah. Okay. You know, and rivalry, you know, post Cold Wars, so forth. What should I be expecting? You might meet a few angry people out there, to be honest with you. When you say angry, what do you mean by that well, exactly? The thing of the rights, for instance. People are still angry. People right. are angry. Young people are angry. They want to be heard. They might want to be heard, but tonight, they don't seem to want to talk to me. Do you want to talk to us for a while? No? I don't think many people really want to talk to us right now. I mean, the, the bright light probably isn't helping, but um, hopefully David will find us someone who's willing to talk to us soonish. It looked like it was going to be a frustrating visit, but at least I was beginning to understand why people wouldn't talk. I've just spoken to a couple more guys um, here in Stockholm, and they keep using the same phrase, which is dry snitching, and they believe that talking to us on camera is basically a gentle version of going to the police and snitching. Um, and the frustrating thing about it, the incredibly frustrating thing about that, is the things that they're saying are so valid and so, so bang on to what we're trying to talk about and discuss in this programme that I can't, I think frustrated is an understatement. Off camera, people told me they felt poverty and police harassment drove them to seek security in gangs. But they wouldn't tell me on camera. <laughs> I wanted to say to you guys what they said to me, but they're never going to do it on camera at least. Oh, I'm so, I'm so angry. It makes me so angry. 
Finally, one man does come forward. You lot, you lot up for talking? Yeah, I right, cool. Hello, man. You all right, Reggie? He's Shaquille Nascimento, age 22 and a refugee from the Congo. He's lived in London since he was 14, and he seems to know about gang life from the inside. Would you say that you're involved in any gang? Would you no, say you're not? I'm not involved with a gang. I've got friends. Yeah? Friends, but the police class us as gangs. Yeah. They say we're gang, but they don't catch us doing no gang activity. Right. They say, I ain't got a criminal record, but my name's well known by the police. He clearly knows a lot about tensions in the area. How dangerous does it get around here? It's yes, very dangerous. See, a friend died on the 31st of this month. Another friend died in 2007, innit? In what was it? Do you know what was over? No, I don't know. We never know what was over, but both of them got shot. How easy is it to escalate from, from being just a normal kid who's getting in trouble the at area, school to going... The, the area, the area grew up in. A lot of beef you see out there, it goes on. It never stops, innit? Yeah. Because it's like the older generation started the beef, innit? Yeah. Then the younger generation carry on the beef. The beef, I mean, well, beef will never stop. Shaquille wants to tell me more, but thinks he said enough in front of his mates. We arranged to meet a few days later. London is just one of the many places where teenage gangs have caused big problems. Two days after last summer's riots began in the capital, violence broke out on Merseyside too. A different city, different people, but many of the same problems, and teen gangs taking a large part of the blame. Gang turf walls here have reached as far as cyberspace. But they're also an alarming part of the real world too. I'm heading for the place that became the focus of the battle between the rival Nogger Dogs gang from Norris Green and the Crocky crew from neighboring Croxton. In 2007, this pub car park was a scene of one of the most notorious teen gang shootings of recent times. Breaking news this evening, an 11-year-old boy has died after being shot in the head. It was part of a turf war, but the victim was a boy who had nothing to do with the gangs. He was just on his way home from football practice. The 11-year-old boy had been playing football with friends in the Croxteth area of Liverpool. Rhys Jones was killed by a bullet which had ricocheted off a wall and hit him in the back. The gun was fired by 16-year-old Sean Mercer. He'd intended to shoot a rival from Norris Green to earn his spurs. The boys who played football with Reese Jones are now age 15. This is their team, Firtree FC. I went to watch one of their weekly practice sessions, supervised by coach Steve Gagan. Give us 10, boys. Although the dreadful night of Reese's murder was over four years ago, it still has very painful memories. I remember it like it was yesterday, actually. I never heard nothing. I never heard any gunshots. I don't know why everyone else in the area heard them. I shouted to me dad that, oh, Reese's on the floor over there, what's happened? Just before I got there, a girl got there and she was screaming, he's been shot. And, and not registered. He was bleeding quite a lot and then I just remember I just started crying, really. Just numbness and I, I, I felt my whole body shaking. I, it was just not, I didn't know what to do. I knew. You know, I knew I knew he's had no chance. Firtree FC hosts an annual tournament in honor of Reese, and teams from all over the country come to compete for the Reese Jones Cup. That's a great ball, well played. But even on the football pitch, there are reminders that gang violence is only just below the surface. Some teams were causing us some problems. One team actually said they were going to come back and shoot us. And by what happened to our team, we don't take threats like that lightly. Why did they want to shoot you guys? Um, a bad tackle went in. Um, then their team got quite aggressive. So, so, so what goes through your head when you think something as small as a tackle can cause a shooting? Like a bad tackle, they're obviously going to go in in football. They're just the heat of the moment and the game and stuff. But to say they're going to shoot someone because of a bad tackle, uh, I find that quite disturbing. 
So, a decent bunch of lads who want nothing more than to enjoy their football can be threatened so casually. I was learning that you can get drawn into street violence, whether you want to be or not. It seems like sometimes you don't even have a choice. It may be easy to get caught up in that world, but what about getting out? Is it possible for young people to break free of their environment and leave the gang life? I've got an appointment with a guy in East London who I hope can give me some answers. Sheldon Thomas runs a project in Stratford to counsel and rehabilitate gang members. It's called TAG, Target Against Gangs. They use their strong Christian beliefs to try and convince young people that there is a way out. What we've done is to get the main players in these particular gangs and get them to change the guys in the gangs. So it's, we've got a philosophy of each one teach one, reach one. Today they are reaching out to a mother on this estate. Her 15-year-old son has become heavily involved in crime and she's worried. Both Sheldon and his assistant Gavin McKenna are ex-gang members themselves, so they know the score. But they're not the only visitors today. Must probably come to nick one of them. This is what happens all the time, you know what I mean? The 15-year-old has disappeared. You've come to, what, arrest him? What, has he done, breach? No, it's been more serious than that. I thought so. He needs to be arrested for an arson, basically. Hey, it was uh, not him, it was Mr. He needs to be interviewed that about is, it, none of this, so... But I discover there's more to the case. Last night, this house was visited by a gang who shut up the windows and front door. It's a message for the 15-year-old and his family is living with the fallout. People think, ah, oh, this don't happen every day. It happens every day. No one wants to really do nothing because we're sitting in there talking to a mother and a father. And look how they struck the mum was. Yeah. I have to live here. The son that's caused the trouble was never here. Sheldon's one of the people the government speaks to about gangs. He's even had a meeting with David Cameron. Today, I'm watching him in action. Hello, Sheldon. Reggie. What's Sheldon's take on personal responsibility versus environment? Does he think it's down to the individual, or is it about forces beyond their control? But before we get around to any of that, he receives an urgent call. Yeah, this is Sheldon from Gangsline. You don't need to worry so much about the six-year-olds. It's more the eight, nine, and ten-year-olds. A teacher in East London is worried about a gang problem at her school. And the ten-year-olds are very sneaky because they're getting drafted in at that young age. You so are hearing it right. Sheldon is talking about primary school kids. In this particular school, they're already showing signs that something's not quite right. Um, with some of the older guys who are about to go to secondary school, they're 10 years old. How would you draw in someone that young? Very, very rarely do you hear a policeman stopping a 10-year-old. They know that, so they give them young guys, look, here's a little £10. Now, £10 to a 10-year-old is lots of money. Right. Before you know it, that's how they get you. Because £10, another £10, now he's got money. Now, he ain't getting much money at home because obviously mum's maybe struggling or whatever. So that's how these guys are getting caught up in it. Well. No wonder Sheldon thinks prayer is the answer. Father Lord, if we bring another session to, to the forefront today, Father Lord. Christianity is at the heart of his project. Keep our mind focused on the young men that we have to go out and sow a seed to. Father Lord, let us have our goals fixed on them to bring them into the kingdom. Today we're talking about who am I? Because everything we do has to relate to what the man there on the road is doing. Sheldon's style is like a street preacher. They step one step, they pull right back. So if you're from He starts by getting his team of former gang members to think about the things we can't control, which upset us. Just touch on it. What exactly are you angry about? Uh, father figure. One, okay. What are you angry about? Things that happened in the past. Exactly. Now I've come to observe, but I'm being asked to offer my thoughts too. I don't know, I didn't know I was involved. For, uh, I guess frustrations, various frustrations. Various. Sheldon demonstrates how these outside issues can weigh us down. This is what they're carrying with them at all times. This is them. But he believes we have to accept the hand we've been dealt and move on, rather than letting outside frustrations hold us back. I don't have to get up in the morning and be angry at something I can't do nothing about. What we can do something about, watch this, is about us. It's a persuasive message. The thing that came across most for me was that some of the stuff that he said actually 
really applied to me, you know. Um, I mean, my start out isn't that different to the people in the room. And hearing what Sheldon has to say sort of rung true with me in, in, some, in some places. We pray, Father Lord, for a divine intervention. To Although I'd experienced some of the frustrations I'd heard here tonight, I didn't join a street gang, whereas they did. And should I take credit for that? Or had I just been lucky? I left with more questions than answers. It's been a week since my visit to the hotspot in South London. Remember I'd arranged to come together with Shaquille, the guy from the Congo, the only one who would talk on camera. Well, he's been in touch and agreed where to meet. Not at the hotspot, but at a cafe in West London where no one will recognise him. Hello, love you. Can I grab a tea, please? I'm hoping that away from the hotspot, he'll open up further about whether or not he'd had a proper choice about getting involved in gang life. After an hour, I was wondering whether he would come at all. When he finally turns up, there's an explanation. The arrival of his new baby. Shaquille. Hello, man. How you doing? You all right? Yeah. Good to see you, bro. You OK? It's fine, thanks. You look tired, man. You all right? Yeah. Man, the baby was born, like, last week, Wednesday. And, you know, crying a lot, keeping me up for week all day long. Like, while the mother's sleeping, I to look after the baby. Was you in the room when the baby was born? No, nah, that's the problem still. Social service involved. Like, they were trying to keep me away from my own kid, kind of thing. Social services were involved? Yeah. The family never likes me. They don't like me, because I ain't gonna lie to you. From the nine months when the girl was pregnant, I wasn't really there for the girl, because I was kind of shocked. Do you think uh, this problem may have come from, from your reputation or yeah, what you do or what you're anger. known for? It's anger. It's anger, proper anger. I don't know how to serve things. Thank you. I don't know how to serve things. That's, that's, that's my problem. Yeah. And I find it so hard to apologise sometimes. I don't know what it is. Yeah. I find it hard to say sorry sometimes. Shaquille's begun to open up, but I want to push him further. He may live near the hotspot in Stockwell, but don't he and his friends have a choice about getting involved in gangs? Tell me about the T-shirt you wore in today. My friend Sadiq. Sadiq Adi V, um, yeah. the person that got killed in Stockwell yeah. like, this year. And he was shot, he was shot, uh, how many times? Uh, I think he got all shot like seven times. Not far from the hotspot. Yeah, exactly. It is hotspot, it is hotspot. But there was nothing bad to say about him. He was a good kid. Proper good. Do you think it was mistaken identity? 100%. Right. 100%. Oh, most people just killed him because they're from my area. Yeah. See, that's the way I see it because my area got a lot of problems with other people, innit? But Shaquille's gang hadn't just been victims of violence, they were behind some of it too. So what sort of stuff did you do then? Crazy stuff, like, you know? Like what? Things I don't want to see on TV, because it's like... Are these violent things? Yeah, a lot, a lot of violent things in my past. See it, but... I never, ever killed anyone, though. See it? I don't... I, I don't know. I, I, firstly, I ain't Are you never proud of it? I'm, I'm proud I ain't killed no one. Are you proud of what you did? Some things I am, some things I'm not. So what exactly is your view on gangs? Why do you think there's so many in this city right now? I don't know. People, some people join gangs for the wrong reason, I think. People join gangs for girls, money, respect. What's the right reason? There's no right reason to join a gang. I personally, I told no one to join a gang. Cause all this gang life is just long. It's not worth it. At the end of the day, you've got to die or go to jail, innit? Shaquille had to leave. I appreciated how honest he'd been with me. But I was left wondering how he would manage away from his estate. Could someone who'd been so deeply involved in gangs ever really find a way out? Having a daughter now means that he's definitely got a reason to turn a corner, and I hope that he'll do it. But with the level that he was in before and the fact that he's been through so much, the question is, can he actually do that, you know? I'm heading back to the other side of London to see Talisa. She's another one who's found it hard to escape the world of gangs. She's trying, but is she succeeding? Tonight I've been invited for dinner with Talisa and her mum, Juliet. The family has had its fair share of problems, as I was about to find out. Hey. How are you doing? Nice. Yeah, good, thank you. I can smell dinner. First, I wanted to try and talk to Talisa's mum on her own, 
On the menu was a Ghanaian speciality. Hey, Juliet, can I pop in? Come in, Reggie. How's it going? Lovely. Nice. Lovely. Can you smell the food? It does smell good. Jalof, yeah? Yes, Jalof. Wonderful. Jalof is lovely. <laughs> the bombshell for Juliet was discovering that Talisa was taking drugs. I had no idea she was even smoking cannabis. So she came back from school one day and I happened to be searching through her bags just by chance and there was a card in there that said, girl, lay off the weed. I thought, what's the, what's the weed? Uh, you know, it never occurred to me that none of my family ever smoked, so mm -hmm. I didn't even know what she meant, what, what was meant by weed. She described one of her lowest mm -hmm. points being the point when she was actually stabbed. After that happened, did you fear for your daughter's life? I, I, I was... I, went, I wanted to state of shock. I allowed my daughter to sort of go away from me so so far as to get into gangs and to be stabbed as well. You know, it just showed me where, where I was, everything was going and I had to take a deep breath and stop. Uh, do, you, do you feel that she is 100% away from the person she was? I, I'd say 78%. <laughs> so what about the remaining percent? What is it that's, that's still, what is it that's keeping her? Because we're not completely, she's not completely, completely open to me, but I've developed a sixth sense about her. And I can tell what she's telling the truth, I can tell what she's not telling the truth. Juliet was clearly doing her best, but I wanted to know how family life had affected Talisa. Her mum and dad were divorced, but now live separate lives under the same roof. Over dinner, it didn't take long for the issue of her parents' relationship to emerge. I mean, knowing that you're, you're close and you've got a relationship, how... How do you feel about knowing that, knowing that what you did in the past hurt your mother so much and damaged your relationship with her? Well, it's more complicated to say, but I didn't intentionally mean to hurt her, but then pretty much how like my mum and dad never got along, and my brother was more close to my mum, and it's like, oh, now it's more close to my dad, it's like I didn't have to fight attention. Yeah. But I know my mum cared about me, but because my mum and dad always used to argue, it confused me about who to like and who not to trust and who to love and who not. So when my dad left, I thought my rock left because my dad was like the person I loved the most in the world. Mm. So when he left, it just broke my heart and my world just went to an end. For the first time, I feel we're getting to the heart of Talisa's problem. In her eyes, everything came down to her mum and dad's separation. How did you feel about your mother at the time? I didn't hate her, but I just didn't understand why it couldn't work out. I was 10 when my dad left, so I was still at that age. It was just really about me trying to find myself and trying to scream out for her attention. She knew she had to get away from me because I seemed to be the perpetrator of her unhappiness because her father had to leave this house. But then she, she was too young to understand the ins and outs. She's, she's seen the police be called to this house before. And she, she, um, she knew what was happening. But when, when the break finally came, she wasn't ready for it. Mm. And so in her mind, oh, it's my mum's depriving me of my father. I'm going to be bad. You thought I didn't care about you? 60%, yeah. 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 At that time, how important were your friends to you? Ooh. That's the only thing that didn't give me problems. So you saw your mum as a problem and them as... Because as... it was arguing a lot of those times and she kicked me out before. So yeah. it, it was a lot of arguments and I didn't feel wanted here and I felt like a dog. It wasn't because I didn't want to be with her, it's because what I felt in this house, I didn't feel this was my house anymore. It must have taken a lot of courage for Talisa and her mother to speak openly. I've had a chance to meet a mum who understands the importance of a stable family and how disruptive it can prove if the influence of a parent is taken away. So what does this mean for Talisa's future? I think the fact that her mother has embraced her in the way that she has is a key part in keeping her on the straight and narrow and moving forward in the direction she wants. And, and if Talisa is able to succeed as the person she wants to be, her mother is a key part of making it happen. Back in the Northwest, there's someone else I want to see. He lives on this estate in Skemmersdale, 15 miles outside of Liverpool. He's the writer and lead rapper on this video. The song warns about the dangers of carrying knives. JJ. Oh, yeah. Nice to see you, mate. Nice to meet you, brother. You all right? Yeah, good. JJ Hunter was once a member of a gang that terrorised this estate. Now he's going straight. He's got strong views on what drives young people into gang crime. One word, money. People who were driving cars down the way, 50 grand, and 
moving away into big houses, you know, so they start seeing what they're earning and what they're doing and then they want to progress with that, don't they? So I think that's where it starts, to be honest with you. Seeing people with a lot of money and a lot of respect and then you, you want to aim for that as a child, like, you don't know no different, really. So when you were younger, you saw the gang lifestyle as being glamorous? Yeah, to be honest with you, yeah. It's, it's stupid to say at this age now, but at the time, definitely, yeah. <sighs> I've been bouncing from one side to the other in terms of how I look at how young people get involved in gangs. Yeah. And um, some people say it's environment, some people say it's attitudes, and I came into this believing it's just about the person as the individual. Yeah. What do you believe is the real reason for young people getting involved? I wouldn't say the person. That's just my, my perspective. I'd say the environment and the family members, to be honest with you. Like I said, if you're living in an environment where there's not much going on and you're seeing people doing more than what you are, and making a lot more money, I think. I think that entices you a little, doesn't it? And that's part of your environment, not yourself, isn't it? It's a simple idea, but thinking back, the temptation of easy money was something I'd heard from Sheldon and Aaron in London. You gotta go and get money however you can get it. That's the mentality of the young people. Put 10 pounds, another 10 pounds, now he's got money. Then there was the gang in Stockwell, the all-about-money gang. Maybe money really is what it's all about for many kids and teenage gangs. And what did Talisa say to me? They used to sell drugs. I didn't really care as long as I got the money. As a teenager, I too was faced with the temptation of earning fast money. But I was also lucky to be given opportunities in the TV world. So, personal responsibility versus environment. What do I think now? I came into this, this journey believing that it's all about the individual and about a, a person believing that they can essentially take their environment, ignore it and move forward regardless of what's happening in their own lives. But off the back of spending some time out here in the Northwest, I think my mind's starting to change a little bit. I'm a very proud and stubborn person. I don't like to be proved wrong, but I definitely believe environment is a massive part of how well a young person can do and whether a person gets pulled into drugs, gangs, criminality or not. I'm reaching the end of my journey and it's time to say my goodbyes. Back in London, Shaquille had told us he was on a decorating course at this college in Greenwich, but he's gone off the radar again. I was hoping this would be the best place to pay him a last visit. I think Shaquille seems to be a guy who understands what this opportunity actually represents. And um, yeah, hopefully today we'll see him embrace that. Hello. Hello, Benita. Hello. Hello. Rich. Rich, Benita Ager runs the college and she was happy to show me around. Um, they're here from 9 in the morning till 3.30. They specialise in offering opportunities to young people from deprived backgrounds. Just right for Shaquille. It was a place that could give him hope and an honest future. So where was he? He was really excited to be on the course. We brought him on. He only attended for a couple of days. He did his induction. Hang on a second. He only attended for a couple of days? Yeah, yeah. I'm so is he not here today? He's not here anymore, he's off the course now. Why is he off the course? Because he just didn't attend. We've, we've rang him, he said he was ill one day, then he said he'd definitely be in the next day, and then the third time we rang, he switched his phone, and we rang him an extra four times. We couldn't just get hold of him. Right. Well, um, that was a bit disappointing, wasn't it? <laughs> uh, the idea was to, to see Shaquille at work, as it were, and see him actively going out of his way to try and um, do something with himself. And he's not here, and he's not been here for a while. And um, I'm a little bit disappointed, if I'm honest. Hello, is that Shaquille? How you doing, mate? It's Reggie. How you doing? Have you just woken up? Why have you just woken up? Why are you stressed out? He agrees to meet by the river an hour later, but I'm worried this might be another no-show. When he turns up, he looks like a man who really doesn't want to be here. 
Are you dead? Oh. <laughs> you all right? Yeah, of course. Are you sure? Yeah. You don't look here. Talk to me, man. What's up? What happened? How come you haven't been going to your um to your classes? Right. The things they're doing, I've done it a couple of years ago already. They're teaching me things that I already know what to do. Come on. What is it that's so hard about putting yourself out there? No one wants to give me a chance. Someone gives me a chance to change a lot of stuff. Do you know what, Ashiko? There's going to be a lot of people watching this right now that don't know you, don't understand the choices that you're having to make right now, and they're going to be thinking, if he just grinds it out, gets himself a job, does what he has to do and just swallows his pride, everything will work itself out. People could say, do this and do that, but when you're living the life that you used to live for God knows how many years and stuff, yeah? It's not that easy for you to give up everything that you had. The only way that I know how to make money is the way that you always make money, and that's not a good way. But I don't know what to do right now, and I'm just stuck. I'll be real with you. Well, you say you're being wrong. Have you stepped back into that world, or are you no, that's at what I'm the trying crossroads? To tell you. That's what I'm trying to tell you. I've been away for a couple of weeks, yeah? I'm just doing a lot of thinking. The last thing I want to see you do is go down the road that you don't want to go down, but it feels like everything is pushing you in that direction. Realistically, where are you going to end up in two years, bro? I'll tell you the truth, I don't know. But I don't want to end up dead or prison. And I don't want you to go the wrong way, brother, but, you know, this might actually be the last time that I speak to you, and um, I don't want to walk away thinking that you're going to go in the wrong direction. What do you think is going to happen to you? I'll make a promise with you, yeah? I'll try my best not to go back to that way again. What do you really want for yourself? I want to be a good father. And I want to make my dad proud. That's the main things to me. And how do you think you're going to achieve that right now? Get up my, get up my chair and do something positive, but it's hard. It's hard to try. It's hard. I'll keep trying, I'll keep trying, but everybody keeps shutting the door in your face. I ain't getting nowhere. I really want Shaquille to keep the promise he's just made to me to give it a go. But sometimes, wanting isn't enough. I'm sad to be saying goodbye. I feel like Shaquille needs long-term help, but he's also got to learn to help himself. Let's hope he makes it. Back at the project in Covent Garden, one person at least is trying to make the best of his opportunities. Not only is Aaron becoming a success as a mentor, but they've also given him a job. Three days a week, he earns £8 an hour doing admin, but it's less than what he would earn in a street game. It tempts me every day. I see it every day. It's part of my environment, that's all I see, but um, it's a conscious decision I've got to make as to, you know, where I see myself, my family, my friends, the people that gave me opportunities now. You know, I can't let everyone down like that. And what about Talisa? How is she coping with life away from her gang? Is she strong enough to do the right thing and resist the lure of easy money through drugs? I want to help, but I know it's up to her. I said we'd go shopping to see if she's managing to budget for herself, but when we meet, she says she's just had to pay 200 pounds in rent arrears. So I lend her 20 quid. I've got to ask you, if we, um, if we hadn't helped you out today, yeah. Um, how would you have paid for your shopping, or would there even have been any shopping today? There would have been no shopping, not going to lie to you. No? No. What would you do in situations like that, then? Like, you just go to your friends to find on, to find on your friends. That is actually expensive. So with the money that you're living off now from benefits, mm. where is all that money going? Are you, be honest with me here? Yeah. Are you smoking any of that money? Not as much as before, a little bit, yeah, but not as much as before. So what would happen if, if you stopped smoking? Do you not think that you'd save have more money? Save money, you save the money. Even now, I have it smoked for like three, four days and I feel fine. It's just when I get the money, it's a bit tempting, but... I hate to sound like an annoying art teacher or something, but in the next 12 months, you're going to need to focus and not be drawn back in. But from what you're saying, there's a good chance you will be drawn back in. All right, I promise. Well, make me, well, tell me something that will make me believe that you won't be drawn All back right. in. If I went back, I'd be a bigger fool than I am now. And the way I'm feeling like a fool, I don't like that feeling. I'm not saying never, say never, but I know this is not going to happen. You just got to trust me on this one, Midge. Trust me.
When I started this journey, I thought that you make your own choices in life and that you just have to live with the consequences. I'd always had to accept that and I believe that everyone else should do the same. But what I've seen these last few months has changed the way I feel. I came into this process believing that a person is in charge of their own destiny, but since meeting people like Shaquille and Talisa, I think environment has a huge say on how far someone can go. I think more than anything, I've got a newfound respect for, for how fortunate I've been. I found myself at a crossroads when I was younger, and um, I made a very clear decision not to go down a certain path. I've looked at anybody who's made a bad decision has had a tough start as weak and as, um, and as stupid to a certain extent. And I think I've learned that there's so much more to somebody who's finding it tough, especially somebody in a teenage gang. This process has, has taught me a hell of a lot about how hard it is to make a positive decision when a negative decision can benefit you massively in the short term at least. And when you're living hand to mouth, the short term is so much more important. Perhaps what the young people I've met really need is a long-term future that they believe is worth keeping out of trouble for. And the Criminal Britain season continues tomorrow night at nine as Pips Taylor discovers why thousands of rapes go unreported in I Never Said Yes.